Bienvenida, ¿cómo Gracias. estás? Gracias. ¿Todo bien? Bien. Bueno, acá tienes tu público. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? Bien, vamos a hablar. Vamos a hablar un cacho. Bueno, Betty Young es Venture Partner de 500 startups, porque ella no se queda con pocas cosas. Agarra y ¿qué quiere? Mucho. Muchos. ¿Sí? Somos 850 empresas invertidas. Pero dices 500. Eh, son 500 fundos, creo. <risa> bueno, Betty Young con ustedes. Betty. Gracias. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm actually going to... Oh, thank you. I'm going to make this uh, presentation very interactive. So jump on, participate, and uh, I promise I'm, I'm going to leave some time for a question and answer. So before I get started, I'm curious to know who is interested in founding a startup or is already currently working in a startup here? Okay. And also, like, another question is, who has been already in the Silicon Valley or has been exploring the model of Silicon Valley innovation? Okay. That will be interesting. I'm going to talk. So my talk is going to be about both Silicon Valley and, of course, we're here to talk about Buenos Aires to the world, whether, like, what to do to become a, a, a global founder and also the perspective of being in the Bay Area. So that's uh, me. That was, uh, who knows where is this? Where is this? Come on, I, I need interaction. Help me. Fosli Wasso, yes. So this is sort of your neighborhood. I was born and raised in Fosli Wasso, and that's how I learned my, my Spanish. This is a photo my dad took of me from, probably not this camera, but he was using the film. And then I had to eventually find a photo, scan it. But right now, when you look into today's interaction with photography, we are actually looking more like the digital format of Instagram. Like anyone can become a photographer here just with your mobile phone. So I'm actually curious to know, I know the audience is pretty different. Who actually uses Instagram? Okay, a lot more people. That's good. <laughs> We're getting like more interaction here. So Instagram sort of background is it sold its uh, company to, to Facebook. So two of the founders, the one that's right in the middle, it's uh, it's actually, actually Mike Krieger. He, when you look at his Facebook profile, he actually is based in San Francisco. But when you look at it, he's from Brazil. He's from like, we were talking a lot about like uh, Latin America. Like when you look into the profile, like it's a really great company that had a significant exit, but he uses Silicon Valley as a platform to launch his startup and eventually have a really successful exit there. So the first thing for everyone to remember that I want you to, like if you leave something from my conversation today, there are two things I want you to remember. The first one is we believe that great founders come from anywhere. Like, I've been living in the Bay Area now for 10 years, and then people always ask me, oh, you see all the deals in the Bay Area? Like, do you think like there's a competitive advantage for like someone in the US, someone sort of educated in Stanford or Berkeley? And at the end of the day, we really believe, and then you can see from the facts, right? You, I really believe like founders and, and really great mind really come from, from anywhere. And that's sort of one of the cases we look at uh, in case of Mike when he sort of founded Instagram. And sort of continu continuing on the concept of Instagram, the other thing for us to remember, I want to use that as, as, a, as a sort of Hogan storyline for a, like the moment we're living right now. When you look at Instagram, I show you like on the first picture that my father took from me was from the film, and it used to be Kodak used to be a really relevant business, but they filed for bankruptcy, and the year they filed for bankruptcy was the year that Instagram actually sold its operation to Facebook. So you're thinking about a traditional model used to make money, all of a sudden there's a disruption into the model. So photography today looks really, really different. 
even like 10 years ago, right? And a lot of you are sort of part of the Instagram and know what the movement is, and it's really recent. So the second thing for us to sort of remember is we're going through a time for, like, we are not in a linear sort of time. It's, it seems to be pretty obvious, but all of a sudden, you can create, like, a two years, uh, two years old, business disrupting an over 100 years old business. And all the changes become really exponential. And the more time you go through as we sort of look forward, it's like the timing for, for, for the transition or the tipping point for the exponential moment is getting shorter and shorter and quicker and quicker. So that creates all of a sudden opportunities for all of us. It doesn't matter where we are. Remember like the first thing we said, great founders come from anywhere that we actually get to participate in this new game, that it used to be a lot more traditional. So the second really great news for us who are interested in becoming founders and being founders is that opportunities are exponential. And the thing that I want to sort of take a deeper look, right? We look at the first graph before, it was like linear and exponential, but there's always a specific point where it seems to be not growing, and all of a sudden, everyone's talking about it, and it gets really exciting. And the, the question is, when is the tipping point happening, and how do we identify when the tipping point is it's happening, right? So 500 startups, uh, it's a fund, like I was uh, introducing before, we, ha we have a really large portfolio, we have 850 companies, because what we want to do is to be able to find companies before they take off and double down when it's working. So we are sort of really looking at how do we really crack this model, right? So just being a little bit specific to look at the same sort of tipping point or exponential growth is Angry Birds. So how many people play Angry Birds? Yes. So I love Angry Birds too. The, there were three guys who started Angry Birds, and it took them 51 games before they really were able to find the game that made them really successful. So there's so many little bets, there's so many li different tries that you have to do, and it's very often you don't know whether you are giving up before the tipping point comes, right? But when you sort of cross that chasm, then all of a sudden everything and all the opportunities sort of come together. So the message for founders is do, instead of plan and this whole new beautiful innovation, great idea world, it's build, test, and see if it's working. So there's a huge movement uh, called Lean Startup, and that's sort of based on this principle of you should build it, you should test, you should measure, and sort of change accordingly as you are building the business. And that's how, for instance, when Angry Birds launched its different games 51 times, it never worked out. This is what the moment like they kept on trying, they were able, with a great team, they were able to, to find success. So as you're building, as founders, you're, as you're building startups, think about this process of building and iterating and this feedback loop of, build, of getting the, the results from the market and do it accordingly for, from, from what market is telling you. So the, it's, it's interesting because the, all of a sudden we're talking about founders are global, opportunities are exponential, but what, what is making this sort of very special moment that we all lived in? And it's been sort of transitioning, and I'm gonna go through really quickly of like the trends of where this is transitioning. So let's compare like the past 20 years, right? 10, 10 years as a mark point, and then sort of when internet started, we're talking a lot about the exponential changes, are talking about digital, mobile. And uh, the, the factors are that Today, you need a, it's a lot cheaper for you to build a company. So some, you need like three guys, in the case of Angry Birds, and then you build a, a successful company. And uh, the cost to build it, it used to be five million. Now with 5K, 10K, 
fortunately, we become a lot more independent to what our investors want. The, of course, the internet usage had, internet and mobile usage has increased, and then also like the speed of that, uh, of the internet has allowed a lot of different services to come together. In addition to being a lot cheaper to build a company, it also, from all the different platforms that exist out there, it became cheaper to find your customer, to do distribution. So at the same time, there are two trends going on there. One is cheaper to build, and second is it's cheaper to distribute to, to your customer the, through all the sort of platform that exists out there. So just to iterate what we were saying before, to remember, we started with Instagram saying like they have a great founder who is an international, uh, was born in Brazil, uh, you, need, you really don't need a lot of capital. You don't, really don't need a lot of people to build a, a multi-billion dollar company. And that's the same thing with WhatsApp. So on WhatsApp, when they did their $19 billion exit, they had actually 55 employees. Uh, where is the founder from? Help. Who knows a little bit about the internet? Ukraine, yes. So that sort of just show us like, how much opportunity is really out there and, and you can come from anywhere. So that sort of moving a little bit towards like from an investor perspective, we invest in a lot of startups, right? We ask founders when they come and sit with us, we're like, oh, you have to iterate, you have to sort of do your lean startup. But when you look at the traditional industry for what we call venture capital, it has remained very traditional. And then what we should be doing is actually also run the model of the lean venture capital. So when you look at the trend, we're talking about changes in the last few years, right? We look at the changes of like building companies, and when you look at the trend of the capital itself, this is a data from uh, like few sources from CB Insights, Silicon Valley Bank. When you look like the past five years, and uh, that's basically when you look towards the left, uh, you're looking at early, those are stage financing, right? If someone's getting, doing a startup, they can get like a seed capital and then a series A and a series B. Those are like stages that as company grow, company uh, investors comes in. You can see the blue line, that's for like the first check, the, the early stage. You can see how much in the last five years it had, it had increased from 7% to almost 30%. So, Investors, all investors are following all these trends. Capital sort of, when you look at the data, and look in the past, you're really looking at, there, there's a change of power. Like, it used to be really expensive to build something, so you have to convince an investor to put a lot of money in. Now, it's really cheap to build something, and a lot more capital is really like flowing in into, into the startup world. And that's, of course, Silicon Valley, right? Sort of perspective. So, that sort of goes through for us, for like what we are doing. It's very similar, that's for 500 strategy, very similar to what's happening in, in terms of the trends. We're looking, we're doing a lot of small bets. We're doing like first check, doing like 50 to 100K, and then if companies are working, then we put more money. That way, when we're talking about that tipping point, we start being able to find signals and patterns of when that tipping point is coming so we can put more money into that. And it is put into our model that uh, fail and companies are not going to move forward are probably around 80%. So that allows us to take a lot more risk, that allows us to really be able to find disruptive companies uh, as we're doing investments. I'm gonna actually run really quickly. I think I have 15 minutes, I wanna leave time for, for question and answer. So I won't go, if you guys are interested a little bit on the 500 model, I can talk a little bit more about it. But what we really believe is that we're building not only like a fund, we're building a network of mentors, a network of founders that can help our companies become successful. We have presence in the Silicon Valley, so we are in Mountain View and, and San Francisco. And I will not jump into the Silicon Valley piece of it, and we can talk on question and answers later. But one thing that is important about Silicon Valley is that it's a change of mindset. 
It's a change of ecosystem thinking. So when you go through what's ma what makes, because I think a lot of people want to ask the first time, right? When I started, it's like, who has been studying the Silicon Valley model or who thinks like Silicon Valley has a lot of innovation? But at the end of the day, it's the mindset of people that's making the change. So one thing that I want people to remember today is like business can be global and we as entrepreneurs, we can actually participate actively. It's everything sort of locked into our mind. So this is a little bit of some photos of uh, Silicon Valley. So when you look from, from top, you can see that starting in San Francisco and uh, moving to Mountain View. And it's the culture that really drives the innovation. On the culture piece, there are three things to remember. One is we definitely take a lot more risk. So when you look at 500 model, we have, uh, we model in that 20 to 25% companies are successful and companies can take a lot more risk and failure is sort of embedded to that. So it means also higher return opportunities. The second and, um, concept that's sort of associated with this and the third together is that we live in the Bay Area in a very collaborative environment. So mentors participate because they want to help companies become successful. And at the same time, when you look in the Silicon Valley, about 50% of the founders come from somewhere else, Argentina, Venezuela, Brazil, China, and it's, it's a truly global community there. And that creates a lot of diversity into the ecosystem. So in Silicon Valley, we're looking at three components. One is people take a lot more risk, and failure is definitely embedded to that. Second, it's collaboration. And the third, that everything is global. And I want to sort of close the note on the global context, because the talk today, it's about Buenos Aires to the world. And pre just on the previous uh, conversation we had here, was we were looking at numbers in terms of the, the population in, in like Argentina, South America, Latin America, we talk about China. But this is a very interesting, different framework we should be thinking. When we look at population, it can be restricted by our physical, political, someone says, this is part of China, this is part of Argentina. But the other way to look at it, it's by population number of users. And actually, number three, it's Facebook. Number four, a lot of you might not know, it's uh, Tsen, which has the, the WeChat platform, which is sort of similar to WhatsApp, which a lot, of, a lot of us don't even know like what it is. So when you look into the real opportunity on digital, the opportunity of being global or the boundary we're looking at, actually it becomes unlimited. So I would like to sort of end on this note for everyone to remember that we are living, fortunately, in a very global and interconnected time. And a lot of the power has shifted from other investors, large corporation to us. We so sort of when we look forward, look to the future, we do live in a lot of a democratized world and that gives us an opportunity to build it, starting here or being in the valley. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm here again. <laughs> Hello. For Q&A. Okay. Just for a start. Uh, two things. Okay. Is there any chance for another country to build something like what happened in the Circo Ballet in a little scale, but you have cultural capital, that kind of risk? Uh, if, if you think it's possible, and uh, what we need to do that. And the second is you say that maybe 80% of the companies you start maybe are going to fail. Uh, how many people that fail restart again and make a success? Okay. That's are the two questions. 
Okay, first question I think was related to That's right, that, that one. one, right? That's right. Thank you. So I think the the valley the difference of the the question is can we create or emulate a similar ecosystem to the valley? I think to a certain extent, yes, in terms of culture. Because it's a mindset, like it doesn't matter whether you're physically in Argentina or yeah. in Buenos Aires, you're physically in the Bay Area. It's how you put your network out there. And I think it's possible to build these bridges and be in the Bay Area and take a lot of the resources, capital, and connection back here. The question that really makes it super successful in the Valley is the density of amount of people thinking the same way. So okay. the taxi driver might be telling you what your business model should look like. Versus here, maybe like when you try to share it with your parents or your friends, they don't really understand what's going on, and that sort of creates a little bit more barrier to it. So I think creating, if the question is creating a second Silicon Valley is possible, I don't think that's the direction where most cities or mo mo most small ecosystems should look for. Okay. I think it's more like how do we create a similar mindset and how can it, we create sort of interconnected, it doesn't have to just be with the valley, interconnected sort of network that makes us success successful. So I'm going to be a little specific there. So for instance, one really interesting story was uh, Alibaba had the largest IPO yeah. and they are from Hangzhou, which is a, like the most obvious way to think is like they might be from Shanghai, they might be from um, Beijing, no, but they are from Hangzhou, which is a city that is not that relevant sort of at the larger level. But he did, uh, Jack Ma did a lot of his connection to Japan and a lot of his connection to, to the US through Yahoo. So at the end, when you look at a lot of the opportunities that are happening, they don't have to all go to the Bay Area, but sort of being able to interconnect to a lot of where the resources is, all of a sudden make the opportunity possible. As you say, like a virtual place anyway, no? Yeah, no. it is. A, I think it's is the it boundary of the, fortunately the boundary of physical boundary, uh, it's getting smaller, smaller and smaller. And that's a good thing. Yes, that's, a, that's, that's right. good news for us. That's right. The second question, what happened with the people that failed? You say 80% of the companies fail at the beginning. Yeah. How many of them restart again and make it build a success? Or it's important? Or how many say, well, I f is a failure, I retire? So I'm looking at the small, I think it's hard to say, like, in the whole sort of population of Silicon Valley. So let's mm -hmm. sort of narrow specifically at uh, 500 startups, like 850 companies we already invested well, in. Well, it's a good sample anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a small good sample. <laughs> OK. Uh, a lot of, the, sometimes they, if they failed, they ended up working for other startup and then sort of co-founding or moving and working because everything is sort of early. And often they come back and build a second startup as they feel like what has not worked and they pivot and sort of go back to, to get some more funding, like even with us. Okay. So that happens So often. recycle. There's definitely recycling into the process. It's a failure, a, pro a problem, or it's a part of the career? Uh, well, I think you can be failing all the time, all the time with the same mistake. Okay. I think you can be failing often, fail fast, fail often. That's what they they said. We 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 joke. The culture at five hundred is like move fast, break things. So okay. breaking things means like oh, it didn't work, it broke, right? So I think that's okay. I think what's not okay is if you do exact same mistake over and over. Exactly. And that's what we are always, as investors, what we're trying to measure is like, okay, what was the mistake? Uh, is it the market? Have they learned on, with it? Have we learned with it? Can we sort of build our sort of database to not sort of do the same mistake later? The, the problem with the mistakes is not to learn about it. If you learn something and you can change, it's a good thing. Yes, that's, that's the framework of uh, very, a lot of people who are in the Silicon Valley, that's how they think. Uh, ¿Alguna pregunta tiene alguien? Tenemos algunos micrófonos. Breve, allá al fondo, ahí tenemos un micrófono. Hi. I was talking to a friend a few months ago about looking for fundraising in Silicon Valley to make a project there, but leading from here, not moving myself to the, to the Valley. Do you think that's possible? Because my friend that actually works there thinks there is no way you can run a project 
on Silicon Valley without living there. And you start your, um, your church saying that um, entrepreneurs are from everywhere, right? Yeah. So it depends on which company or fund you ask. I think most, I, first I think there's a, whatever it's in the past doesn't mean that it's happening in the future. So one thing that is important that I think it's exciting, we're, we're living at a different time, right? So venture capital traditionally, they invest in companies, especially angel investors, to places where they can bike to. So it's not even taking a car. It's often like if it's to take a car or a train, it's too far for them to, to make investments. At 500 startups, we do a lot of international investments. So 25% of our portfolio is international. The way we frame it is, and it's a lot related to your talk, like start local. So if you're in a market that's relevant, then you, you should prove your, your okay. startup there, and then you can sort of build on that. So we do have companies here that are actually building for Latin America, mostly, and then they're based here and we have deployed capital. I think what's important to sort of frame that, I'm not saying like, oh, you can definitely raise money in the Silicon Valley. What's important is build the trust. It's the question is, do you have trust from someone that's gonna say, oh, someone is coming from, uh, I don't know where, I think somewhere south, and it's gonna take my money, and I don't know what they're gonna do with it. So if you can build the trust, Maybe like spending some time in the valley, inviting the person to come here, and then there, there's a really good connection, and they believe you can execute. That's the key to raise money, and then you can that if it, that's the way you can raise money in the valley. And the second way to sort of to hack the system is there are a lot of successful sort of diaspora, what we call right, like successful people from Argentine in the Bay Area. They might be investors, they might be entrepreneurs, and they will normally open door for you, and they will be your bridge because people trust them. So it's what's the bridge or what's the easiest way to get trust from an investor? And if you can do that, the, you, you can get capital. But it's definitely spend time enough with someone to build a relationship. Claro. Acá hay una pregunta del joven. Hello. This is Pablo from the other guys. I've been knocking some doors at Silicon Valley. Okay. And one, one thing that I perceived was that they kept asking me about Brazil, the region. Like, it was like I think that they were expecting us to crack the Latin American market, as they see that this has a lot of potential growth. Do you think that, from your perspective as an investor, it's a plus for us in terms of should we be looking more to the region rather than to the, the world or the global market? Oh, that's a hard question. Uh, it's, it depends where, what your, the differentiation that you have, right? If you want to crack global market, but you are here, you have no insights to whatever consumer you are doing. If you want to do accounting and you're trying to serve someone accounting in the US, I think that's very tough. I think the question to answer whether you should target regionally or globally, it's where do you think it's going to get, first, I think the first question is, how do you think you're going to get fastest? And what the, what's the cost to get there, right? So it's the speed and the cost sort of related to that. I personally have a hard time thinking about Latin America as a region. If we're thinking about e-commerce, you have, you have payments that might be like working in some geography, might not work in some geography, delivery that might be working with some geography and some not. But maybe if you're talking about media, everyone look at like Facebook and Spanish speaking, so that will allow you to reach your customer faster. So the way I would frame that is what is your network of distribution and whether like do you have an insight to that distribution through the product you're creating? And that might be regional, that might be global, but if you're building a global company, and you need the network, like if you want to use the network of Facebook, Google, those companies are in the Bay Area. You're going to get a fastest time to them if you're based there. So I think it's a, it's, it's a depends question, but the way I would frame that is speed, cost, and, and then on the first stage to it, and then the, the potential of the revenue, of course, associated with the network that you are sort of coming in. Una pregunta más. Acá. 
Espera que llegue el micrófono. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Leonardo. Bienvenido al país. Bienvenida, Gracias. Tomás. Eh, mi pregunta es eh, con respecto a el, los inversionistas. Uh -huh. eh, a la hora de apostar por un proyecto, por una startup, eh, ¿qué importancia le da o qué peso tiene que el producto ya tenga eh, antigüedad, que ya esté en comienzo o que recién esté en el plan de negocios? Uh -huh. ¿Incide o no incide? Uh -huh. So, yes. yeah. So I'm just gonna. I think not everyone is on using the microphone. So if I understood right, the question is how important it it, it is to have like a working prototype or a working product versus like a business or a plan. Or a track record. Yeah. Or a small track record. Or a track record. Yeah. The, and that's a little bit of like how I think, right? It doesn't mean like that's how all investors think. Is the question I'm constantly asking myself is. Are you going to be able to execute what you say you're going to execute? It doesn't matter which stage you are in. It doesn't matter whether you are on the concept, whether you are on the working prototype, whether you, you are sort of already sort of hitting up a large market sort of users, right? So in terms of sort of stages, we're thinking about whether you have a product fit, and then we're thinking about whether you have a market fit. Product fit is whether your technology, your product, it's interesting, and then if you're going to get traction to do that, right? So when I'm doing investments, I'm constantly thinking about, are you going to find a product market fit, whatever you're pitching me, right? So if you had built a business that is successful before with a track record, then you have like, then I build trust on you. It's like, oh, I think you can do it, even you don't have a lot. If you have never done that, I will be asking several other questions to try to understand whether you have a working prototype or not. What we like to invest is you don't have to have huge traction, but we want to see a working prototype w with some early insights of what, what we call unit economics looks like. So unit economics means like, okay, if you are to find this customer, how much would that cost? And then how long would they stay with you? How much can you monetize on them? And then whether, when they, they're going to leave. So when you sort of matters that you don't have to have a million user, I have to make sure like on the 100 users you have, what is the unit economic and whether that makes sense or not. So we're looking at two things. One is what's your capacity for execution, like easily shown if you have track record. If it's not through that route, we also sort of would like, we definitely want to see early prototype with early hypothesis tested. Because we want to, you to be constantly testing and then if you don't have if you don't have a working prototype, it's just very hard for us to test, especially if you are in the accelerator program. But we have invested pre-prototype pre companies in the accelerator from Latin America. We have done that. Betty, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Very interesting. Gracias.